kind of talk them down or yeah. intervene in some way? Mm -hmm. What about you? That's true. Like someone might see something going on, he doesn't want really, to like try to help the person. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's good. That's good. All right. So how is this? I see you all have questions written out. So are you going to uh, go one at a time? Or are you going to alternate? How are we going to do this? We're going to go down the row. Down the row. So who's who's number one? Okay. Okay. What did you want to be when you were a child? I wanted to be a teacher. I thought I wanted to be a teacher. My dad was a teacher and my mother had been a teacher. So I think oftentimes when you grow up in a place where you see what people are doing around you, you know, when you're a child, that's the thing that you think that people do yeah. and that you want to do. So I thought teaching. Up there, teacher. What? You looked up for your father as a teacher? Yeah, he was a professor at the University of Massachusetts mm -hmm. in Amherst, yeah. which you guys probably all have heard of. Mm -hmm. And um, that's what he did. That's what he always did. He walked down the hill every day and he went and taught. What do you teach? He taught finance. And my mother was an anthropologist. She taught anthropology. So um, growing up as a child of two teachers, I wasn't quite sure what I'd teach. And then there were teachers along the way that I really respected and liked a lot. So it seemed like a pretty natural thing to want to do. Um, what was it like growing up for you? What was it like growing up? I grew up in a college town, sort of like you all are growing up in this college town. Um, as I say, my dad and my mom were both affiliated with the university. So I think that in many ways our lives were, you know, were kids on one hand, but then we saw all these people who looked to us like they were so old, you know, who were college students. Because when you're a kid, the college students look very old. Um, and, you know, obviously the professors look even older. But it was a great town. It was a, it's a rural town. It's in western Massachusetts. It wasn't, you know, living with big tall buildings and stuff. We had a beautiful town green like a typical New England community. We had very small schools. You know, when I went to first grade, it was in a very small brick building. And then when we went to second and third grade, it was another small brick building. Fourth and fifth grade. So it wasn't these giant schools. Um, you know, people walked to school. People rode their bikes to school. Um, I think, you know, along the way, we probably at some points even came home for lunch. So it was a, it was a much slower time, and it was it seemed a lot less, um, well, it was a lot less urban than the experience that my daughter's having growing up. And I was one of five children. So yeah, we it was were a big family, <laughs> big family. Who or what influenced you to become a sports writer? Uh, circumstances, in some ways. It wasn't something I set out to do. It wasn't something that I had in really in mind to do. I had gone to college at Wellesley College, which is near here. A college that none of you will go to because it's an all-women's college still. However, I loved it. I had um, majored in art history. Uh, I loved art history. I don't know if you know this, but when you're a professor, every seven years you get what's called a sabbatical and you get to go off and do research and study. So my father, in my senior year of high school, had had a sabbatical, it just came up that way. It wasn't that he asked for it, it was just seven years it came up. And so we went to live in Europe, and I got to go to school in Europe for a year and fell in love with art. Because in Europe, you think a lot more about art, I think, than you do here. Mm -hmm. We visited museums, I took a course called The History of Art. And so when I went to college, I just majored in history of art because I loved it so much. I loved that experience. But when I finished college, I wasn't so interested in working in art history. I didn't want to go to graduate school. I didn't really want to work in a museum. I'd worked in an art gallery, didn't really like it. And so I kind of had to think about, well, what else do I know much about? And I really loved sports growing up. I played sports, and I knew sports. So one night, I was invited over for dinner at a friend's house, and this man named Frank Gifford, has anyone heard of him? God, you guys are really a different generation, what can I tell you? Frank Gifford was a uh, football player with the New York Giants. He was sort of a matinee idol. He was probably the most handsome football player. He played both offense and defense. You know, that was before they kind of played with helmets and stuff. But 
he was loved. And so when he finished his football career, he ended up becoming a broadcaster, as a lot of football players, you know, today do. And he was a broadcast sports broadcaster for ABC Sports. And so at this dinner, he was there at this dinner, and I was sitting across from him. And he had just come back the year, he covered the year before for ABC, the 1972 Olympics in Munich. And it was a very famous Olympics, sadly so, because 13 members of the Israeli team were murdered during that Olympics. Um, it also had some very amazing sports things happen. Mark Spitz had won seven gold medals, etc. So we ended up talking most of that night. And at the end of the night, he said to me, which back then I took as a compliment, he said, for a girl, you know a lot about sports. How do you think that made me feel? At that time. I wouldn't necessarily today, but at that time, I thought that's pretty cool. Yeah. So, um, but then he also said, you know, if you ever happen to be in New York and you want to come by and meet some of the people at ABC Sports, you know, look me up and all the rest. So that was really nice. So what do you think I did? Yeah, I did that. I made a point of going to New York and looked him up. And so I went down to New York City. I really had never been there before on my own. And um, got a chance to meet a lot of people at ABC Sports. And some of the people I met were, um, was the only woman producer there. And she was working on a special called Women in Sports. And she was working on it because there had been a law that had been passed by Congress called Title IX, which is probably one of the most famous laws that exists. And it was about uh, gender discrimination in, in education and saying that any school that had any dollars from the federal government, like this school does, almost any school does, could not discriminate on the basis of gender, which meant that they couldn't, for example, have a boys football team if they didn't have a girls soccer, you know, et cetera. So girls didn't play many sports because there weren't a lot of teams before then. So this was a time where women were starting to really begin to play sports. So they were doing this special for women in sports. So I just hung out with them. I thought this was pretty amazing. And I met Billie Jean King, who was the amazing tennis player, who had just beat Bobby Riggs in the Battle of the Sex. So this was like opening up a whole new world for me. So right then and there, I decided this was what I wanted to do. I wanted to come to New York, and I wanted to work in sports. And I wanted to work specifically for ABC Sports. Um, so I did. I moved down to New York. And, well, I actually went back and interviewed with ABC Sports officially, and um, I didn't get a job. And they wouldn't hire me as a secretary because they said that they noticed I graduated from Wellesley College and didn't think I really wanted to be a secretary. And I didn't, but I thought it was, ever heard the expression, foot in the door? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they wouldn't give me that foot in the door. And I didn't have the um, broadcasting experience to get a job, you know, as, like, as a production assistant. But I moved to New York anyway and figured that I'd kind of hang out. And so I did that. I hung out and I went to events and I worked as what's called a gopher. Ever heard that? It's an animal, right? G-O-P-H-E-R. In this case, it's go hyphen four, F-O-R. Go for. It means that if any producer or anyone there says, go for this, go for that, do this, do that, you do it. You're the lowest person on the lowest of the totem pole. But you get to meet everyone. So I would just do this on weekends, or I'd, you know, see an event, and I'd, I'd go to it, and then, you know, sign up to be a gopher. Didn't get paid much. And so to pay the rent, I became a secretary at a magazine called Harper's Bazaar. So I became the secretary, but at a different magazine, and then did the sports thing on the side. But I got to know enough people that eventually a couple of them said, well, you know, maybe you should apply for a job at Sports Illustrated, maybe you should do this. You know the idea of networking, have you heard that term, networking? Networking is when you go out and you just meet people who are doing what you want to do. Okay? It really pays off. It really pays off. It paid off for me. Because I got an interview at Sports Illustrated, and I thought it went pretty well, but then a week later I got a rejection letter, which I put up on my wall. So I'd look at it every morning, okay, well, got rejected. And so I'd keep doing my stuff. You know, I'd go and do the gophering thing, and I'd be the little secretary every year. But I kept sending postcards and letters to the guy who seemed to like me at Sports Illustrated, but hadn't hired me. So 
I just say, you know, I'm out here, I'm working at the US Open, isn't this fun? I'm up on the 18th P in the broadcasting booth. And, you know, just tell them everything I was doing. And so, eventually, I got a call back from him about four months later asking me to come in for another interview. And that time I got the job. So, um, you asked a short question, I gave you a long answer. But that's how I ended up at Sports Illustrated as a, what's called a researcher reporter. And the main task of that job, which I had to learn because I'd never studied journalism, I knew nothing about journalism, but I did know a lot about sports, um, was that I was supposed to fact check the stories that the writers did. Back in those days, the writers would be out in the field, they would send their story in, sometimes by Western Union. Click, 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 it was typewriters, no computers, okay? Different time. You know, this fax machine, six minutes a page to get it out, you know? It's a whole different time. My job was, as that story was going through, my job was to be sure that there was nothing, nothing in that story that was factually incorrect. Okay? So that was how I learned journalism. I learned it by doing it. I learned it by getting assigned then to what was called the TV radio column, which ran every week. Now, why would I be assigned to TV radio call? Not as a writer, but as a researcher. I like you. Well, remember how I got there. Think about that for a second. Where had I been before I came to Sports Illustrated? No, at NBC Sports. And I'd been, you know, of course, writing all these letters saying I was doing this and that. So they thought I knew a lot about TV and radio, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So that's what they assigned me. And it was great because it became my beat. And instead of having a sports beat, I had the TV radio one. But what was great about that is that all the TV radio people were right in New York. They were right in Midtown. Our building was like on 50th Street, and all of ABC, NBC, CBS, they were all within three or four blocks. So I got to suddenly be able to do and learn a, way, a lot of reporting. I could go over and interview people. I didn't have to get on a plane and go out to a game or anything. Mm -hmm. I had it all right there in my backyard. And, and the column ran every week. And because it was a column and the guy I worked with was really very supportive and wonderful for a man to work with, you know, if I had an idea, he'd say, well, why don't you try to write it? Well, I'd never written a story in my life. You know, everyone else, a lot of other people who come to magazines, and this is true today, they say, what, you, what do your clips look like? What have you written? I didn't have any. So I had to teach myself how to write. Okay? I mean, so there was a big learning curve. But, um, you know, I found people who were mentors, um, particularly some of the women there. And um, they were terrific. And um, they really worked with me on stories and taught me how to take an idea that I had and how to do the interviews, how to do the reporting, and then how to sit down and try to write it. You know, when you write a sports story, it's very different from writing a final paper for, you know, English class, right? Mm -hmm. Very different. It's a different style of writing. When you read a sports story, you're not reading a story, a, a report like you would do with your five paragraphs and your thesis and your sentences, right? Yeah. But, the, you know, the basic structure is the same, but it, it's not the same. So I really had to learn a whole new skill. Yeah, and, yeah. So ask the next question. We'll go on to something else because I'm just sort of blabbing. Um, wait, are you up next? Yes. Okay. okay. Did you ever in your life thought you were going to be a researcher? Well, I don't know that I ever thought of that title, but I think I thought that I might travel in words and facts and all of that. I mean, it didn't seem alien to me when I started doing it. As I've said, I didn't really have the preparation for it except that I really knew sports. You know, my dad had, I mean, this is the great thing, too, is, you know, my dad, um, we had five kids. The first two were, were girls, and then there was a boy. And early on, he just decided, because he loved going to football games, he loved going to basketball games, didn't matter. He was going to take me, he was going to take my sister. You know, he wasn't waiting for the son to arrive, you know, to share the sports experience. And we were always encouraged, you know, to participate in sports, and because we were in a town like Amherst, we were very fortunate. We had sports for girls. Okay? Not every town did. So, um, you know, my bankable skill was because I was very conversant in sports. I could talk sports like a guy. Mm -hmm. You know the big difference that made? Huge difference. Mm 
But I really had the confidence that I could, I mean, at the top of any of you guys got sports. Probably why I threw right into the table. I mean, I'm very confident about it. I know it, mm -hmm. you know. And a lot of uh, a lot of women don't necessarily, particularly of my era, you know, they just didn't play sports. They didn't know sports. They didn't follow sports. But because my dad had taken us on road trips, you know, with the UMass football team, you know, when they'd come to Harvard or come to Holy Cross, we'd go and we'd watch the game. And so I learned early on, you know, the four downs and the three and the penalties and the flipping and the the chains moving and the whole thing. And I knew it with baseball because they brought me in and went to Fenway Park. Mm -hmm. You know, I knew, I just, I knew it. So yeah, maybe I didn't think I'd be a researcher, but somehow it felt yeah, like it was a good place to be. It felt like it fit once I got there. All right, so what's next? Mm -hmm. Do you ever feel like you have to prove yourself to anyone? All the time, I still do. What do you guys? Sure. I mean, that's what you do every day, don't you? I mean, when you walk out the door, you've got to prove that you're up to what you have to do. I think. And that's how I live every day. Mm -hmm. You know, when I got on the machines today, I was proving that I could, you know, get on the Stairmaster and, you know, do the 30 flights in, you know, six minutes. You know, you're always kind of trying to challenge yourself and trying to prove that you can, you can do it. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Okay. What was it like trying to get into the locker rooms? Oh my God, we're already there. Okay, so we didn't yet get to how did I, how did I move? Okay, as a journalist, yeah. just for future reference, okay, in terms of asking questions, I would often never go in with set questions because I always wanted to hear what the person was saying, and then I wanted to follow from what they were saying to what seemed the logical. So the question would be really. How did I get from being a TV radio reporter to even getting in a position, right? So you want to rephrase it? I mean, again, I don't mean to be critical, but I'm trying to give you some guidance here because even if you have set questions, if you're not quite there yet, yeah. Was, yeah. So what would you what would you want to know before that? How did you get from TV radio into back into sports? Specifically like, baseball. Yeah. All right, well, baseball was my favorite sport. My mother loved baseball and loved it from when she was a teenager and she used to sit in her room with thumbtack pictures of all of the, Red, of the uh, Red Sox players around her ceiling and she'd listen on the radio and she'd keep score and she'd keep a whole scrapbook full of them and that was what she did with her father. And she passed that love on to me by taking me to Fenway Park and you know we'd always listen to the Red Sox and listen to baseball. Baseball was like my sport. I loved it. So when I got to the magazine, I thought, well, you know, what would I like to do? I'd like to do baseball. Well, baseball was the national pastime. Now, football sort of gone way past it. Now, you know, football, look at you, right? You know, you're not wearing the San Francisco Giants. You're wearing the 49ers. I mean, football is sort of the big thing. You have, you have the Red Sox. So that's good. Um, but, um, you know, that's a hard beat to get on because a lot of people want it. Mm -hmm. I mean, not just me, but it's like a big sport. Yeah. It's a big sport. So, and I, you know, I wasn't necessarily, you know, there's a lot of people ahead of me in seniority. Well, the magazine always had two researchers, or had historically two researchers, reporters assigned to baseball. And one of them was a sort of senior reporter uh, named Jim Kaplan, and he was sort of the guy, obviously. And then there was a woman named Stephanie Salter when I got there who was the second baseball reporter. And the woman was usually the one who didn't travel a lot with the writer, who sort of stayed behind. She was the one who did more of the fact-checking of the story. So, you know, we worked a, a Thursday to Monday week because sports are played on Saturday and Sundays. So, you know, when Jim might travel with the writer to do reporting with him, Stephanie would be back in the office and when the story came in, she work on checking it. So that was the pattern. Well, Stephanie decided to leave the magazine at one point. She wanted to go out, she wanted to do more writing, and she wanted to kind of she wanted to move across the country to San Francisco. So she left. I've been to the magazine then about a year and a half. And as I knew she was getting ready to leave, I sort of put my hand up and volunteered to what's called do the baseball books. 
all of these are old-fashioned notions to you, but we kept all of the baseball stats back then in three ring binders. And it was someone's job every day to go to the newspaper and pick out the box scores of every game that was played, the agate type. And every game that was played, each of those box scores, the main information from each of those had to be put into little rectangles in these baseball books, transferred from that by pencil to this. No computers, no Googling it, no looking up. So these baseball books had to be kept so that every Saturday night they'd be given to the baseball writer who was responsible for writing what was called the Week in Review, which was the section of the magazine where it told you exactly what had happened over the seven days in each of the leagues and each of the divisions. And those baseball books had to be absolutely accurate because that was what they were writing. That's what they were based on. So I rose, raised my hand and said, I'd, I'd like to do the baseball books. I mean, it doesn't sound like a very exciting job, does it? It's pretty boring. But I did it because I knew that it would show that I was really interested in being quote, a member of that team. Mm -hmm. And that's the way you demonstrate it. You do what is at the bottom of the totem pole before assuming that you can do what's further up. So I did that. So every morning I'd come in, it was about three or four hours, I'd just be transferring information very carefully. And then on Sundays I'd you know, often be asked to check, back check the columns once they were written. So um, once Stephanie had left and they went to, quote, assign a new baseball reporter, I got that assignment. That I was very much considered to be in the same mode. I was the woman who would basically stay behind and do the fact checking. Mm -hmm. And Stephanie, you know, even a few years before me, had not gone out of the office very much on assignments. But, you know, because I'd done the TV radio and I was now used to going out and doing reporting, I thought, well, I'm not a baseball reporter, I can go report. Mm -hmm. So I would just go to the office, you know, every day during the season, I would go to the office every day. And then I would just go to a game at night. I had a pass, you know, that would get me into every stadium, American and National League. So if the Yankees were in town, the Yankees and Mets were, you know, the National American League, and they often would play separate schedules, so only one was in town at the same time. So I'd either go to Shea Stadium or I'd go to the Yankees. I'd just get on the subway, I'd go, and I'd be at the stadium until 11, 11.30 each night, and I'd do this every day, you know? I'd do it on weekends. And what I was doing was just beginning to learn how it all worked. Mm -hmm. But I was a little surprised to find out that I was literally the only woman reporter. Because it was such a huge beat, everyone wanted to be a baseball reporter, that once, once you were assigned to be a baseball reporter, and most of the men who were around there looked like they'd been there for 25 or 30 years. You know, so not only am I young, much younger than most of the people, but I'm the only woman. And so I had to figure out how to negotiate this new world, you know. And so what I did is I just began to, you know, study it like my mother would as an anthropologist. Just began to figure out how people did their jobs. I'd go listen in when they did their interviews. I'd go sit in the dugout and listen while they interviewed the manager. So I was just picking it up, you know, just learning. It took me a long time. There's a lot to learn. And, uh, you know, I'd go up in the press box and I'd be sitting there and, again, I'd be the only woman only one of them, they'd be looking at me like, what are you doing here? I mean, and I didn't know it at the time, and I'm kind of glad I didn't, but only a few years before I had arrived, women weren't even allowed in the press box, okay? They weren't allowed in the press box with the men. And, and they weren't allowed to even eat their meal, their pregame meal, with the men reporters. They had to eat it on the roof, like at Fenway Park. The woman went to cover a game, her food, because the team would always, you know, give a meal to the reporters in between when they did batting practice and their interviews. They'd come up and they'd have a meal and then they'd go do the game. The women weren't allowed to even eat with them, okay? I mean, you guys shake your head and look at this, but I mean, that's astonishing. That's astonishing to me. And I didn't know that history then because, again, we didn't have Google. I mean, people weren't, you know, this things had happened. I now know it. I can look it up on Google and see the history. But, um... So being in the press box, I mean, it wasn't a warm, fuzzy feeling. It wasn't like, oh, welcome, you know, and everyone was going to talk to me. There were a lot of people who never would talk to me. 
So anyway, I spent a lot of time just adjusting to this new world and figuring out how I was supposed to kind of do a job in it if I was going to you know, try to do reporting and the rest. And then, of course, there was how do I approach the players, and you know, they're not used to talking to a woman. And so what do I have to do to make them aware that I know what I'm talking about? All of those things. So I think I became a baseball reporter, I think, in 75, although I was just then kind of beginning to go up and look around. 76, I really started doing more reporting, you know, and would go out occasionally on the stories. And I think that year I started to write actually a couple of small baseball columns. I did think I did one on Dave Winfield, did one on uh, a couple other, you know, pitchers, that kind of thing, a couple of players. Um, and then 1977 comes along, and that is the year where your question now comes into effect, because I'm sort of, I'm on my own up here. You know, my editor's not holding my hand. He's not with me. I mean, I'm kind of just trying to figure this out by myself. And so I'm, you know, talking to the PR person for the Yankees and trying to say, well, you know, I'm not getting many players because what happens is they run out way after batting practice and then they're in the locker room. All the male reporters are in there before the game. I can't be in there. So how are we going to deal with this? And can you get me a player to come out? I mean, so all those questions, just trying to figure it out. So one day he approaches me and he says, you know, he says, follow me. And he takes me around the other side of the clubhouse locker room. And we go in the side door. And he walks me down this narrow corridor and he puts me in what's the manager's office, Billy Martin's office. It's outside the locker room where the players are, but it's inside the clubhouse. He says, okay. He says, I think we can make this work. He said, why don't you just plan on just coming into Billy's office afterwards, you know, after the games. And, you know, hang out with him and, you know, you probably get a little sense of what, you know. I mean, that's as good as I can do for you right now, was basically what he was saying. Um, so then we get to the World Series in 1977, and the Yankees are playing the Dodgers, the Los Angeles Dodgers. And, um, you know, it's a big series because, of course, the Dodgers used to be in New York. They used to be the Brooklyn Dodgers. Then they moved to L.A. Now the Yankees and the Dodgers, which had a lot of World Series competitions when they were Brooklyn and New York, which was Cross City, now they're back and they're playing each other. But for me, it's even a bigger deal because it's my first World Series that I actually have a credential for that says I'm you know, a certified reporter for Sports Illustrated. I'm there to work. Mm -hmm. And so all this time that I put in to kind of developing these relationships, negotiating, learning how to do it, I finally figure, this is it. This is my moment. I finally get to work. And um, you know, the way everyone else does. And so I realized that I have access to Billy Martin's office, and that seems pretty good. That's okay. I'm not going to press that. So I decide that I'm going to go and ask the Dodgers whether I can have the same access. You know, go in and talk to Tommy Lasorda, who's their manager. And so I go up to the game the day, the, the day before the World Series is going to start. It's a Monday. And I go up to the stadium. They have pregame workouts. And just, you know, sometimes, sometimes, Life works in strange ways. I, take, I end up taking the subway up, I take the elevator down, and in the tunnels underneath the stadium, I'm walking toward the Dodgers a clubhouse because I want to try to find Tommy. And just as I'm walking down the corridor, he walks right out in front of me. I mean, it was like, oh, this is sort of meant to be. Mm -hmm. So we stop and talk. He says hello. He knew me well because I had been out doing some long interviews with him the season before when he had just been made manager. So we knew each other pretty well. And I said to him, I said, so here's the deal. What do you think? And he really, I could tell he didn't want to deal with this. And so he quickly introduced me to a guy named Tommy John, who was then a pitcher for the Dodgers. Ever heard of Tommy John? No. Okay, All right, so it's a Tommy John elbow surgery. Oh, yeah. Exactly. This is Tommy John. He was a pitcher then for the Dodgers. It was, uh, and then he would later become a pitcher for the Yankees, actually. But he was the player rep at that time. So Tommy was sort of introduced to me to Tommy John. I walked down the tunnel to the dugout to the field with Tommy John. And we talk a little in the dugout. I explain it. And he jumps right over the idea that all I want is access to the manager's office. And he's suddenly talking about access to the whole team. 
And I said, oh, okay, well, you know, yeah. I said, and I looked at my credential, and my credential that I'm wearing around says, I'm Melissa Lucky, Sports Illustrated. I have access to, and it says the field, the press box, the clubhouse. So I look at my, I said, yeah, okay, well, I have access, sure. And he looks at it and says, you have access, you're a credential reporter. He said, let me go back and take a vote with the players and see how they feel. At that point, I wasn't so wild about that because I didn't quite know how it was going to happen. And after all, I did have this credential that said I could go in. But I said, fine. And he said, just meet me here tomorrow, Tuesday, right before the first game, and I'll tell you how it turned out. And so I met him behind the backstop. And he came out and he said, you know, listen, he said, it wasn't unanimous. He said, but a majority of the players said, fine, you're a credentialed reporter. You have every right to be there. If you want to come in, come on in. I said, fine. Um, he said, I have one thing to ask you. He said, would you please go and tell Steve Brenner, who's our public relations person, that we've had this conversation. So I did that. I was happy to do that. Um, I mean, I didn't, you know, I never wanted, to, it was not my objective to barge in and create a scene. You can see all along the way I'm sort of asking, mother may I, mother may I, mother may I. Um, and so I had the permission, so I went to Steve and told him. And during the course of, as the game got started, obviously Steve mentioned this to other people, that this might be happening. And word traveled very quickly to the commissioner of baseball, who was seated down next to the field in the ceremonial box. And on the fifth inning, I was called up for the main press box. They don't have enough room for everyone in the main press box, so I was in a thing called the auxiliary. And my name came over the little loudspeaker there and called me up. And so I went up, and it was then that I was told that the commissioner was rescinding any permission that I had to go into the Dodgers locker room that night. And so that's the circumstance that set up the legal action that followed. You know, it wasn't that I barged in one night and someone kicked me out and I said, you can't do that. It was because I had actually had the credential that said I could go in. And the players had also voted there okay for it. And the commissioner basically, his argument was, the Dodgers don't have the right to give you the permission. Only I can give it to you and I'm not giving it to you. So it was sort of like permission's not even rescinded because it wasn't really even given. I'm the only one who has the ability to give it to you and we're not. And then as the series went on, they took away my right to go into Billy Martin's office as well. So I was left with less than I started with. And so um, a, through a series of, of things happened. I was, you know, my editor called me in Thursday morning when I got there and asked me what happened, said they wanted to consider doing some kind of action to see what could take place. I was asked to write a letter to the commissioner. There were meetings that went on through several months after that. And when they realized that they were at a point where they weren't making any progress and the commissioner was absolutely not going to give equal access. An interview room outside of the locker room was not sufficient because the players, it was shown during the sixth game when baseball